Welcome to this very special Amazing Race 9 episode of You Are Number, the Amazing Race podcast from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Harmstone, and joining me as always is the Canadian who is the hunted every time yield season comes up, Logan Zonders. Afternoon. And I'm very pleased to say that joining us today is the guy whose swan boat race with Eric last week ended in failure, so we had to wait until this week to join us. It's Tyler McNiven. Greetings, Earthlings. Nice chatting with you guys. So, Logan, you're not you're not the Logan that just uh, boxed KSI, are you? Um, not that I am aware of, no. I'm more of an MMA fan. Gotcha, okay. <laughs> A guy would ground and pound this KSI fellow. <laughs> I would pay good money to see that boxing match. <laughs> I would pay Bitcoin, good Bitcoin. That's what we use here in San Francisco for everything. All the cryptocurrency. We use them all. <laughs> So, Tyler, how were you originally uh, cast for The Amazing Race? Yeah, so uh, my buddy who I did The Amazing Race with, his name is BJ Averill. And we met, on semester, we, yes, we, we met on Semester at Sea, which is uh, uh, basically you take a ship around the world and you study each country before you get there. And it's a really remarkable experience to see all these countries. And so when BJ and I first met, we were actually traveling around the world together and uh, we stayed very good friends after semester at sea, even though we went to different colleges. He was at Harvard, which is incredible to uh, believe if you uh, have experienced BJ. He's just a, he's a walking art piece who exists always in the present moment. Um, and is just, you know, he'll, he's the kind of guy that walks into a restaurant and by the time he leaves, he's met every single person there, staring in their eyes for 10 minutes and shaking hands and standing on the bar. And uh, it's usually met with pretty you know, great reception. Um, so he, he told me a few years after college that he wanted to apply for the amazing race with me because he had applied for survivor and made it to the final round, the final 40 people and was not accepted. But the casting people said, you should really apply for the amazing race. We think you'd be great for it. So find another crazy friend of yours and, and apply. So he called me up. He said, Hey, the show, the amazing race, you race around the world. You could win a million bucks. I'd never heard of it at the time, but I said, that sounds really great. So we went to an open call and it was in Bakersfield, which if anyone's familiar with Bakersfield, it is in a very hot part of California, not your know, typical destination city uh, known for you know, kind of malls, auto malls, passing it on Highway 5 if you're driving down to LA or heading over to Vegas. And so we got there in the middle of the night and the open call was early the next morning. We slept in the, uh, in the, in the auto mall parking lot at the door of where the open call was and we were first in line we got there about eight ten hours early and uh, a line kind of gathered throughout the night and we were the first ones to be interviewed um we looked at the camera said we were the first ones to the open call we're going to be the first ones across the finish line yippee and we didn't really have anything planned to say but we just kind of goofed (laughs) off and danced and they got back to us a little bit later they said hey you, you guys are pretty zany and strange but we'd like to hear you actually speaking english and being normal so we know you're not totally insane so we sent them a uh, an application video which is on youtube and uh the video was just us kind of being weird down in venice um they liked it so we went to the semifinals semifinals was a 20 minute long interview in san francisco um which i thought we we botched and i was not feeling good about the interview afterwards but we got called to the uh the finals uh, uh, 20 to 25 teams in LA at Santa Monica and we got pent up in a in a double tree hotel for 10 days we weren't allowed to leave the room except for designated meal times and uh, one gym and pool time for half an hour each day and the only other times we were allowed to leave was when they called us out for various interviews and so we were just in our rooms kind of goofing off and having fun being strange watching all the previous episodes and Um, One of the things we did in our rooms was study every flag in the world, which we'll talk about later, came in big handy for the race. Um, And then uh, right as we were leaving the final interview, they said, hey, guess what? You guys are the final, uh, you're in the final 14 of of 11 teams. So we're going to give you all your shots. We're going to take your passports and we're going to put visas in them. And we're going to let you know in in a few days whether or not you've made made uh, made the cut. They called us two days later. Uh, I remember I was I was getting my international driver's license and I was in line getting my international driver's license and they called up and said, you guys, we got some good news for you. 
get ready in two weeks, you're going to be on the amazing race. And we just about blew our lids. I mean, I was in my mid twenties working at my parents' restaurant, you know, paycheck to paycheck, paying rent in San Francisco, just thrilled beyond belief. And you're not allowed to tell anybody that you're going on the show. And since I was serving at a restaurant where it, uh, a uh, small town family restaurant. I knew a lot of people and they're like, oh, you're leaving, where are you going? You can tell your family members, but they had to sign NDAs. And yeehaw, two weeks later after the finals, final interview, we uh, packed our bag and headed to Denver. And it wow. all began. <laughs> when you guys went to that casting call where first in line, was it because you guys put up a fake uh, sign-up sheet and everyone just followed that? You guys put your names first and then everyone else followed? Uh, we actually brought sleeping <laughs> bags and sleeping pads and just laid down right at the door and relaxed. We actually, I think we got a few hours sleep. So there was, we didn't, we never left the door. We didn't need to do a sign-up sheet because our bodies were there acting as the sign-up sheet. <laughs> um, Crazy. Um, so you only had two weeks notice before you actually went on the race. Yeah. Before you, from when you're officially confirmed. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I don't know how people like with real professional careers are able to do it. It's like, it can be very disruptive to if you've got a family or a busy schedule. Luckily at the time I you know, didn't, didn't have all these things like I do now. I've got my nine month old daughter squirming on my lap and, um, working too much, but, uh, Man, I'm glad I did that. I'm really happy I did the show because it, uh, it was a special experience, to say the least. So when we first went to Denver to start, you've got five days kind of prep and press junket period. And Bertrand Van Munster, who is the creator of the show, uh, he stands he stands in front of all the teams. And you're actually not allowed to speak to the teams before the race begins, even though you occupy a lot of the same space, um, kind of walking past each other in halls, um, eating meals near each other and you kind of eyeball and grimace but you're not allowed to talk to them um so we're all sitting there lined up and Bertrand Van Munster's pacing back and forth in front of us and he says this is going to be the most incredible experience of your life you will never have nothing will ever be better than this and I'm just like oh man like I'm 25 years old like I'm speaking <laughs> early hope that, uh, yeah I sincerely hope that this is not the climax of my life but I gotta hand it to him there's uh well, it wasn't, I mean, having a daughter, getting married, all sorts of other experiences in my life have been, you know, pinnacle experiences. There is truly nothing like being on The Amazing Race. It is uh, as if you step into a James Bond movie and you get to live it for a month straight without the fear of getting shot, uh, but all the excitement of racing at top speed, top adrenaline, not sleeping. I got to enter a zone that I have, I had not to that point and have not since really existed in of just elongated adrenaline existence 28 days of of elevated heightened adrenaline when we got back i actually my body just shut down and crashed and i had this terrible cough for weeks for about five weeks i was just coughing and coughing and uh i imagine going to to war is probably far eons more intense but uh I'm sure it's a lot like that when your adrenaline spikes and then you get back after months of being gone and your just body is like, all right, time to shut down. That's, that's what happened to me. Those are those are the coughs of victory. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we were talking to Eric last week and he said that him and Jeremy had a got a call for uh, season thirty one actually. Um, did have you and BJ ever been contacted to appear on a future season? Oh, that's great. Good for them. Um, uh, no, we've not. Rats, let's do it. <laughs> it it's kind of I'm kind of conflicted because we I when you win the show, you're just when you win the race, you you don't have to wake up in the morning thinking about the one wrong turn you made, the one wrong taxi you got in, the bad decision you made. It doesn't haunt you. Everything you did plays into the fact that you won and. I'm just so relieved that I don't have to kind of play that over and over in my head. Um, although I'm, you know, I'm sure that it, it, it's totally fine. Everybody who I've talked to who is on our, our season was just grateful for the experience. Um, I'm just incredibly grateful that I had the opportunity to see it all the way to the end and cross the finish line first, but uh, doing it a second time, you kind of have, if you've all already won, you kind of have a lot to, 
to lose. Although Eric, that's amazing. He's going back. He's he's already raced what twice now, three times. Uh, he's he's not going uh, back. He was just contacted for uh, for next season. They decided not to go with him. Oh, okay. Yeah, but he's if he's one of the few people that have actually finished the race, and he's done it twice, winning once, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Do you yeah. think that you and BJ, because you guys in, endured uh, two non-eliminations, and I don't think, I know in other international versions, teams have won after uh, being saved by two non-eliminations, but with you guys, do you think you still would have been able to cross the finish line first if you had to go through the the new penalties that they do for uh, for non, non-eliminated teams, like the speed bump or the marks for elimination? Oh, it's hard to say. Hard to say. I'd like to think that we would, we'd be able to pull it out. But after having experienced the race, it's like you just. You, we always said on the show we're racing against our best selves. We're not racing against other people, uh, and we obviously were. But we would tell ourselves that we're racing against our best selves. So we would just continue to try our absolute best, no matter what the circumstances um, were. I, I, I mean, I know the rules now are can be more tricky and dynamic. But yeah, I, losing just our money and stuff doesn't seem doesn't seem too bad, all things considered. Especially considering there was one the one episode where we lost all our money and stuff. BJ had no pants. We started. Oh, my daughter doesn't like to hear that. No pants. I'm sorry. <laughs> but we we started the, we started the beginning of a leg in Australia. It was our second non elimination. BJ has no pants, and it actually it provided to us an opportunity to. Uh, to then ask for stuff and, and because we didn't have anything, we needed to get something. And so what happened was we went to the lost and found of an airport and they didn't show this in the show, but we, we said, Hey, uh, do you guys have any extra pants or shoes we could have? And they, and they um, I think it was the Sydney airport. They lit us, or oh, sorry, not the city of Darwin airport. They let us uh, go into the lost and found room, which was like, I felt like I was in Tutankhamun's tomb. It was, incredible their backpacks and sweaters and bags and clothes and computers it's just like whoa this is amazing um look at this place it's just filled with stuff and they said basically take anything you want so we got bags we got pants shoes kind of upgraded jackets which really helped out and then when we got on the plane we made this speech which didn't make it into the show either but it was uh, this speech in business class where we basically said excuse me ladies and gentlemen there's a time in everyone's life where someone will stand in front of you and ask for your help and they'll need your help because they're on a quest and without your help, they cannot finish this quest. And this is one of those moments. So we stand before you and we ask you to empty your pockets and please anything you can to help two wary travelers on their adventure. And people saw the cameras and they kind of like, well, you know, this looks funny. We'll, we'll, We'll help out. And they had a lot of foreign currency. So we went from having no pants and no money to having fully stocked wardrobes bags and uh and then by the end of the flight i think we had 250 or 300 dollars um and we had more over twice as much money as the next team with the most money so it like i said it having nothing really provided an opportunity for us that we wouldn't have seized otherwise so yolanda's pants weren't enough for you guys (laughs) uh (laughs) they were just so great we didn't want to rip them because we knew they'd be framed after the show (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. so why did you with the yield? Why do you guys end up yielding uh, Joseph and Monica? Um, you know, it, I guess it came down to kind of the spirit of competition, and Joseph and Monica uh, are are great. Actually, really friendly people, and we've seen them as they passed through, passed through San Francisco since. But uh, on the show, it brought out this kind of this real, this edgy competition. And, and we just, I guess, I guess felt like we, uh, there was one thing that Joseph said where we, we had, uh, where he was just, he was convinced we were going to lose and convinced we were the next team eliminated. And that kind of got to us. And so we thought, you know, if he's going to, if he's going to say we're going to get kicked out, then maybe let's, uh, if he's kind of targeting us as the next team, let's target them. And it was not easy. It could have it could have been any of the other teams. Ray and Yolanda weren't really being aggressive to us. The frat boys, the competition was def- was a little more good spirited and funny. With uh, Joseph and Monica, it was it was less playful and more kind of 
sharp and prickly competition. So we were like, well, if we're going to be sharp and prickly, might as well do it to the other people who are being sharp and prickly. I mean, it led to and one that, of the craziest uh, finishes we've ever seen in a leg on the amazing race. Yeah, three-way split where BJ lost his pants. That was really, really an intense moment because we could see all three cars. I mean, all three cars were were right there. We knew it was going to be a sprint. And you're just psyching yourself up for this moment as we get towards the pit stop. All cars park, and we just booked it. And we're running and running. And you get to this dock, and it looked like from our perspective, I can understand why BJ ran in the water. It was a shorter distance to get to a floating a floating, uh, what would it like be a floating raft where you have to use a dock to get to it. And BJ just tried to take the shortcut and s- realized as soon as he was in the water that he was, he was in too deep yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and just, just started waiting. And it was, it was over within seconds. And we're just like, Oh no. And I couldn't get mad at him because from my perspective, I completely understood why he ran in the water. It was definitely from our perspective, looked like the shorter way to go. Um, and it was just, it was just too bad. I remember very clearly not being upset with him and just being like, Oh, well, you know what? We've made it this far. I'm really proud of us. And we're just going to deal with the punches now. Luckily it was another non-elimination, which we'd figured would probably happen considering how many more legs were left. So we had thought there was a good chance of it not being a non-elimination, a good chance of it being a non-elimination. And so we were pretty thrilled that, that we were still alive. Yeah, because you guys still had two non-eliminations to go, and it was only four teams left, so I guess there wasn't a whole lot of suspense as to whether a team was going to be eliminated that round or not. Yeah, not 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 too much, but you, you still, you're not always certain. Yeah, um, could have gone with yeah. the final two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, the we didn't know this, but Sequesterville, Sequesterville is where you get sent if you get kicked off the show. It's, you get sent to a place where you are not allowed to email or phone anybody, check social media, which wasn't really a huge, th- as big as it was at the time. I'm not sure if that's still the rule now, but you go to Sequesterville, and we'd heard that Sequesterville in previous seasons had been a Cabo, and people were playing volleyball on the beach and drinking daiquiris and having a great time, waiting for teams to come in, and every time a new team would come in, they'd line up all the previous the teams that get kicked off and they put them in a room and say, all right, everybody guess who's about to walk through the doors. Guess who's the next team to get eliminated. And people would guess, and then they'd open up the doors and the next team would walk in. And apparently in our season, Sequesterville was in Lisbon, Portugal, and people were in a hotel and they weren't allowed to leave the hotel. It rained every single day that month. Oh, so and oh. people were, people only got to go on one guided trip outside of the hotel one day during that entire month long process. <sighs> So they're pretty much just sitting in a hotel at, while it was raining with no, just watching TV and watching things and, and hanging out and ordering room service. And, uh, and apparently we were voted as the team that was most likely going to walk through the doors almost every single time, but we never, kept, we never walked through those doors. One funny story that we heard in, that we heard later, um, once Ray and Monica made it to Lisbon, they decided to have a big night and party in somebody's room. And sorry, not Ray and Monica, uh, Joseph and Monica. Joseph. It would be a neat hybrid team. (laughs) Yeah, that would be wild. So Joseph and Monica are hosting a a little chindig in the room and they order a big thing of, I think it's uh, vodka. And uh, Joseph on the phone says, yeah, and why don't you send up seven or eight uh, sprites, seven or eight sprites and some vodka. So a little while later, they get a knock on the door and the guy opens the door and there's a big bottle of vodka and 78 sprites on a cart. And Joseph's like, what? What are all these sprites? He's like, well, you sir, you said 78 sprites. He's like, I said seven or eight sprites. <laughs> and those are the things that entertained them while uh, while we were racing and sounded like they kept them busy. They're still drinking the sprites today. They've got a whole cellar, sprite cellar. Man, that beats the Seven Up prize they had in uh, season sixteen. <laughs> what was the Seven Up prize? I believe there was well, there was Snapple and Unfinished Business in season sixteen. It was, it was a Seven. What was that prize, Michael? I can't remember the exact details, but it was lots of Seven Up. <laughs> was it seven thousand seven hundred seventy-seven dollars to share? 
Yes. And I then there was, was yes. a, it was in India, if I'm not mistaken. So it was like a Bollywood themed feast as well. Oh no, that was Seychelles. <laughs> Seychelles was the Sprite. Yeah, it was some sort of local Seven Up themed feast as well. Oh yeah, the, yeah. The Snapple was the Bollywood uh, was the Bollywood feast, and then the Seven Up thing in Seychelles was seven thousand seven hundred and seventy seven dollars. <laughs> That's hilarious. So yeah, Sprite could have gotten in on that uh, if only they did Elimination Station broadcasts uh, as early as season nine for you guys. I'm surprised they don't broadcast Sequesterville. It sounds like, you know, with various dramas and stories there, um, there could be some interesting content. They did it from season 11, then they stopped it at the end of season 17, and then they had, like, Phil's Diaries for a couple seasons, and then just kaput, no uh, no real uh, behind-the-scenes or elimination station coverage uh, after that. Oh, wow. Maybe they couldn't All afford right, to guess- film it or something. Yeah, I guess I kind of blew my cover that I don't really watch the show. <laughs> no, you, you hear it screaming, baby. I'm like, oh wait, TV still is out there? The show's still on? Oh, okay. You have I, an excuse. So, uh, thank you. I, I, It's not that I don't like it. it. It, Honestly, I'll tell you one thing. When I watch the show, it makes me so anxious. It's actually difficult for me to watch because of I, I can really feel what those teams are going through. And it's just my heart races and I start sweating and it's just, it's like, it's difficult. It's painful. And then there's no way I can go to bed after watching an amazing race episode. It's like post-traumatic stress. Yeah, they should have some like a uh, sleeping pill company or like Pfizer and stuff try to sponsor uh, past alumni who watch the amazing race. Totally, totally. <laughs> you should be on their marketing <laughs> department. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that is the end goal of the podcast, is to just end up infiltrating the shows that we talk about, and then uh, we can just get our jobs sorted. Yeah, we're just going to be complete sellouts with Sprite and Pfizer and 7-Up and Snapple. To be fair, we did hard pitch uh, Gilles a little bit, didn't we? Oh yes, from the Belgian version of them all. Um, have you, ever, Tyler? Have you ever tried to uh, take a peg leg and bring it next to next to a termite mound? Um, I'm not sure what you're getting at, but I like where you're going. Uh, can you rephrase the question? Uh, in Australia, there was a task where you guys made a joke where you had to search through termite mounds uh, where a clue was going to be or so- something along those lines, and you guys made a joke about be really bad to have a peg leg right next to the termite mounds. Oh, because they would eat the, the, the wood of the peg leg. Got it. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. I would like to think that my humor has evolved uh, in the last, what is it, 13 years, but uh, obviously it's still pretty bad. So, <laughs> Welcome to Logan's uh, Obscure Reference Corner. Yes, I love it. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Have you two met each other in person? Or yeah. Or are you just like friends from afar? Oh, cool. How do you know each other? Well, we met through the, the podcast, but um, we, we met when I went to Vancouver, what, four years ago now? And then Logan was down there at the same weekend, and then he came over a couple of years ago to stay with me for Christmas, and then we, we went touring around Europe together for a couple of weeks as well. Oh, that's awesome. What fun. Yeah. Amazing Race not only brings the, the teams and the contestants together, but also the obsessive fans. Yeah. Do you guys apply for the show? Have you made an effort to be on? There is no Amazing Race UK. That's the thing. Uh, weirdly, there was a very similar show that got commissioned a couple of days ago over here, um, but I'm not even sure if they're taking applications for it, because it sounds like it might have already been cast. And then Logan's applied for Amazing Race Canada a couple of times as well. Four times. You get, Oh, four times. All right. Fifth times in Toronto. Absolutely. They had Heroes Edition. Uh, Heroes Edition is currently airing on Amazing Race Canada this summer, so apparently me and my race partner are not heroes. Oh, you're my hero. You always will be. <laughs> That's uh, like 20 I, I, minutes ago. It, it's really, I mean, like, I just am so in awe at, like, the, uh, the, the, the really incredible, awesome fans of the show. And I feel so lucky to have got to experience some of, uh, you know, interactions with fans. For example, there was a couple guys in Australia. They called themselves the Tatao Sugar Tit Brothers. And Tatao was our the power call that BJ and I we would yell to each other. And we had these shirts that we had got when we first met on Semester at Sea that said T-T-O-W on them. It didn't mean anything, but we just embraced it as our power call. Tatao, Tatao. 
so these kids in Australia, they would like write Tatao on their knuckles and they had Tatao shirts and they would yell Tatao and they created the Tatao Sugar Tit Brother Society. And they kept having a really good time sending us pictures of them and their friends all Tataoed out. And one of them ended up bringing his family to San Francisco and uh, I, they visited my house and I ceremoniously gave this guy, Damien, who was like the leader of the Tatao Sugar Tit Society, my Tatao shirt that I'd had for so many years. And he, uh, it was just such a fun moment of interacting with somebody who, who had seen the show and I'm giving an opportunity for him to kind of be involved in it in that way. And a couple, a few months later, I told BJ that I gave my Tatao shirt to one of the Tatao Sugar Tit brothers and he felt betrayed. He's like, how could you give away your shirt? I'm like, well, most of the rest of the universe, I will be dead and I will not have that shirt. So why not experience a little life without it? You know? Especially in the hands of someone who appreciates it more than I do. But you and don't dare give away, you don't dare give away your bowling mom shirts though, right? Oh, those would no, those are that I'm taking to the grave. I'll be buried in that in the bowling mom shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bowling mom shirts. Oh gosh. Yeah, it's you think about all the things you could do on the show and then you only do a few of them. You know, we we were trying to get superhero costumes made. And this is I know like now you see a lot of people dressing all wild and more zany. Um in that by that time bowling moms, that was one of the more coordinated outfits that had existed up until season nine. Are you good friends with the bowling moms to this day because of those shirts? Um, I wouldn't say we're good friends. We, we pretty sure we met each other at some of the um, events afterwards and uh, had some good laughs about it. But uh, <laughs> yes, I would not, I would not call them best friends. Did they wear to towel shirts at the time? That's the question. Oh, that is a good question. I think they had to towel. Um, undergarments. I mean, most people do. It, Are they autographed by you guys? Uh, probably by BJ. <laughs> he's the one, he's, he does most of my signing for me. Yeah. The popcorn vendor from Leeds. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and is there anything more brutal than the hot midday Omani sun? Uh, the only thing more brutal than the hot midday Omani sun is watching your friend dig through piles of dirt looking for a buried lamb that has the next clue. Being the first one to arrive to the challenge and the last one to leave, the, the, we arrived to the challenge just so confident that we'd be out of there instantly. There are about 100 mounds of dirt that BJ needed to dig through with his hands to find the next clue. and. I was convinced that he would be the first one to find it since his chances were the best, but he didn't really systematically approach them. He kind of was randomly digging them from pile to pile and uh, teams would come and they would find the lamb and teams would go. And soon it was just us. And we were the last team. We'd watched all the teams pass us up. And I was pretty sure that that was the end of us. And yeah, it was, it was sad. And he kept getting thorns in his hands and not digging the piles. And I was trying to, urge him into systematically like just do it in a grid like fashion then you'll guarantee not dig the same mound twice and he uh he was kind of going a little delirious but uh luckily we found it and another thing we did was we were going to jabrim castle uh, we had tried pretty actively to utilize airplane time uh to meet friends and gather phrases that we could say in each country so we had a little notebook where we would write things that we knew we would have to say, like, are you 100% sure you know how to get to this destination? And we'd have that written in every language, uh, left, right. Um, would you please go as fast as you can? Like, thank you very much. All the, all, everything we thought we would need. And we would make friends that way. One of our friends that we met at the Omani on the flight to Oman uh, gave us his cell phone number and we called him uh, when we were looking for Jabrim Castle and he was able to help us just get there in a in a timely manner because we weren't exactly sure of the direction. And like we did in Greece, we could have driven hours in the wrong direction. Um, so uh, that, I felt like that was ultimately one of our advantages is really being able to use the downtime to study and to get ready uh, for the next leg and kind of uh, give ourselves some resources that we could potentially use as we entered the next leg. 
What was your guys' favorite uh, task during the season? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, our favorite task. The, the task I end up talking about most is eating a bowl of crickets in Thailand. It wasn't my favorite, but it's kind of... Were they at the least well-seasoned? Cool. They actually were, yeah. They, so it's because people... You get you get a few... Like the, the most common questions you're asked after the amazing race are, was it fun is number one. Like, did you, was it fun is number one. You say, yes, is the answer. It was fun. Um, <laughs> what's the craziest thing you did? And it's, we ate a bowl of crickets in Thailand. And it was crazy because not that crickets themselves are too wild, but when you eat an entire, like a big popcorn sized bowl each of fried crickets, like, first of all, they come out and they're fried and they're hot. And you're like, all right, I can do this. But some the grasshoppers are get pretty big, like the size of your thumb. And you bite into them and they kind of pop with pus. And the legs oh. were really sharp. The legs that they used to make that sound at night uh, were cutting BJ's mouth up. And at one point, I remember him opening his mouth and there's all these cricket legs and there's blood from where the legs had cut his tongue. And he's bleeding on his tongue. And you're eating the crickets and then... Next thing you know, you're full and you're full from eating your crickets and these hot fried crickets are now cold, pussy, sharp crickets. And it's just hard to get that much quantity of food in your stomach. And I remember looking out over this rice patty, literally thinking of each cricket as a $10,000 check. Just being like, all right, eat this cricket and you, you might win and you get $10,000 check. I was like, oh, okay, I'll just eat this $10,000. Okay, do this again and just do this again over and over and over. And I uh, eventually got all the crickets down. I could still taste them. Um, that's well, one wicked aftertaste. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Years later, I can still very viscerally imagine the <laughs> bug like taste of a bowl of crickets in the rice patties of Thailand. Um, but uh, bungee jumping was pretty exhilarating. I'd never done that. There's something that happens when you bungee jump where you're standing on the edge and the weight of the bungee cord pulls you, and it almost you kind of it can very easily anthropomorphize this thing where it's like beckoning you, saying, "Come on, buddy, I'm gonna pull you right off this bridge. Come with me. We're gonna jump." And you're like, "Ah, you're scaring me, bungee cord. Don't pull me." And then you jump off. It's like, "Oh my god, this is the most terrifying thing." And then you slow down and you start to pop back up and you're like, "Ah, I'm alive!" And not only am I alive, that was the most incredible thing I've ever done. I'm hooked. Um, yep. But but that. Oh, I was just going to add that uh, the jump over the Corinth Canal they redid 20 seasons later for season 29, and the guy who eventually won the season was screamed and screamed and screamed all the way down, and it has been used as our intro for this podcast over the past uh, two years, and we, we were, uh, we're good friends with him. Oh, that is so funny. The music that we've used for ever since we um, really started the podcast has been the Israeli Amazing Race theme, but his screams going down just perfectly fits with that music. It's startling how awesome it is. <laughs> That's so great. That's so great. I love that you guys were able to use like the blood-curdling cry of an Amazing Race contestant to be part of your intro music. It's he great. both loves and hates it, because him and his partner are the only two races that both Logan and I have met in real life separately um and he both loves and hates the fact that we are still using this as the theme two years later <laughs> I, I i guess i can see why he loves the attention from it but i'm not sure he loves us still reminding him all the time of how hilarious it was basically <laughs> exactly that's awesome uh yeah there's this there's a very distinct like feeling of exhaustion, adrenaline mixture, which kind of blankets my whole memory of the amazing race. So when you kind of ask what's my favorite, what was my favorite task or anything, it's, it was really just this sensation of existing in that space of uh, every moment being so uh, adrenaline packed and aggressively attacking uh, a destination, like willing your body to move from place to place um, and I remember getting back and thinking, if I lived with this excitement and adrenaline on a day-to-day -day basis in my normal life, there's li there's nothing I couldn't accomplish. I just felt like so, uh, I mean, like there's so many hours in the day to do so much, 
and a lot we we let so many of them kind of slip by with a leisurely dinner or uh, you know a relaxing walk or you know that's not slipping by necessarily. I mean that's enjoying life and that's being present. But if you're really kind of wanting to get something done or accomplish some sort of mission, I feel like there's a there's a potential within every human that that can be really unlocked. And the Amazing Race is one of the few times where I, I felt it unlocked to this degree for such a long period of time. Wow. Um, so what happened with you guys and the, there was a passport incident with you guys, as I understand it, early on in the race? Oh, yeah. Was that on the show? No, they didn't air it. Eric told us about it. Eric ratted oh. you guys out. <laughs> yeah, it was in Brotas, Brazil. I, believe, I think it was the, uh, the second or third leg finish line. And we'd gotten across first and we were so excited. And we just won this trip to, to I think we won a trip to Tahiti. And we're elated, we're first. This is awesome. What an incredible time we're having. Um, and then they asked for our passports. The producers asked for our passports and I had been carrying them. I looked down and I'm like, oh geez, I, can't, I don't know where they are. They were in this little black bag and I just could not find them. Then we kind of freak out and we think that we'd left them on a bus, a bus which had returned to Sao Paulo, which is a two hour drive away. And we had a little bug vehicle that we had and they were like, well, you're gonna have to figure out a way to get those passports if you wanna continue being on the race. And I remember Bertrand Van Munster, who was you know, seen as like a reality TV god and made this whole experience possible and been very clear and like, hey guys, you owe me for this amazing experience. And he had been our buddy up until that moment. And he just shakes his head. He's like, you guys cost me a million dollars each today. And we're like, oh no, we let, we let Bertram down. He's like, you cost me a million dollars. You blew it. And uh, <laughs> we were just sweating bullets. And we did our post-race interview just with these long, forlorn faces. We could hardly speak. And uh, so we're like, well, I guess it's time to try and track down those passports and call the bus company and figure it out. We're like, let's take one last look in the in the Volkswagen that we drove back in. We go to the Volkswagen. And I just remember we looked at the passenger seat on the floor of the passenger side. It was very black and like kind of tucked up under the chair was a little black bag with our passports in it. And it was just the most, the ultimate relief. We'd gone from the highest of highs to lowest of lows and then back to the highest of highs. It was just the, the roller coaster of the amazing race and kind of a behind the scenes moment that, that happened all the time. That was kind of you know, behind the scenes moments were, were always happening. And I'm just glad that we didn't have to Go to Lisbon in the rain. Drink seventy-eight Seven Ups. I've 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 heard that drinking seventy-eight sprites though. I mean that keeps up the full adrenaline experience. Or it could just be the sugar and caffeine in it. I I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to say. <laughs> um, which pit stop prize would you prefer the most? Is it a big a pizza pie, a seven day cruise? Or a camera that can do digital imaging? Wow, amazing question. Well, if it was a camera that can do digital imaging, I know what I would do and I know what BJ would do with it. <laughs> and that would be, I would not take it because I would have to pay taxes on it. And BJ would take it and leave it in a box in the corner of his room, gathering dust and never opening it and still paying taxes on it. Um, if it was a pizza pie, I would probably eat it and be pretty satiated. Um, and if it was a seven day cruise, it would probably be me and BJ, uh, like our trip to Tahiti ended up being, which actually was pretty good. So I think I'd choose a seven day cruise. Do you and BJ still hang out together? We do actually. We, uh, he lives in LA and I live in San Francisco, just, uh, about five hour drive, hour long flight. And we see each other pretty frequently. We actually just shot a feature length movie together, um, that, it, we're working on, it, we're, we just picture locked and we're doing kind of the sound design now. It's called The Dock. And we're going to Burning Man in a couple days together, which is the art festival in the Nevada desert. Hotter than the Omani sun? Uh, it can be. It very much can be. Yeah. And, and so we see each other. It, um, we're, we're kind of 
doing different things with our lives, but uh, we, we, we remained very good friends. Um, where did BJ's frog hat come from? I'm st- like, did he just take that from the wizard during Super Mario Brothers three with their frog hat? Like, I'm I've been so confused confused about the origins of that hat for years. <laughs> yeah, uh, I had spent a lot of time in Japan before the Amazing Race. Um, one of the things I did was walk from the south to the north uh, of Japan and had a Japanese girlfriend at the time and. So it would end up with just a lot of Japanese swag in my closet. And one of the things I had was this collection of frog hats. And we would wear these frog hats all the time. And we just decided to bring them on the show, too. And so was, did, he, was, did we both have them or was it just him? I think just, just BJ was shown uh, wearing the frog hat. Yeah. Uh, that was a really intense leg because we had gotten lost in Greece. And we were looking at this place... Uh, this fortress of Rion in Naplios, and I'd run in a gas station and asked the gas station attendant, "Hey, where's the uh, where's the fortune of Rion, uh, fortress of Rion?" He points one way, and I just listen to him, and we blast off and end up driving almost halfway across Greece in the wrong direction. At one point, while we were driving in the wrong direction, we passed Lake and Michelle, uh, some of our competitors, and they saw us, and we honked and waved to them and thought we were going in the right way. So they ended up following us. We get to the complete wrong place, beautiful drive, very, very stressful, figure out we've gone halfway across the country in the wrong direction. So we turn around and we make this four hour drive back to the Fortress of Rion. Com- pretty convinced we were about to get kicked off the show. Um, we were about a mile or two away and, from, this, from the pit stop. And we pull over because BJ had wet socks and he wanted to cross the finish line with dry socks. We pull over and we did not know this at the time, but Lake and Michelle, had, since they had followed us, were still behind us, but they weren't far behind us. They were maybe five, 10 minutes. And so as we're getting closer, our, our camera and sound men knew that there was another team because they had been radioed in by the producers asking where we were. And as we pull over to change our socks, our sound man is just biting his lip thinking, oh my God, you guys, I can't believe this. You are about to get kicked off the show because you want to change BJ's socks. Um, (laughs) Wow. So BJ got his dry socks on. We put on the frog hat and I gave him a piggyback ride up to the castle. We see Phil. We know we're about to get kicked off. And he says, you're not the last team. You're the second to last team to arrive. We'd say, what? Oh my gosh proof that you are never you know never to slow down until you get there unless you know for a hundred percent sure you've seen all the other teams pass and you just do not know so we passed we had a very short interview and then all of a sudden they said okay you gotta hide we hid behind this wall as lake and michelle came running up we watched them from behind a wall getting eliminated they didn't know we were hiding there it was uh it was really really intense i guess you had to bite your lip too as you saw lake and michelle get eliminated on the map uh, yeah, yeah. They, they asked us not to say anything. So we just uh, stood behind the wall or, or crouched behind a wall and then they got kicked off and they walked away and then we kind of went back and finished. I think we finished our interview after that. Oh, wow. Dry, this, that tops the, some of the other ways we've seen people get eliminated. I can't believe an article of clothing could have made all the difference. I know. BJ's so funny. He just loves his dry, I mean, who doesn't love dry socks? But... Wait till That's what it's Dumbledore's favorite thing in Harry Potter's dry socks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, are there any plans to make a Kentaro sequel? Is there, there going to be like a Kentaro to Kentaro Strikes Back or something like that? Kentaro gives Japan back. <laughs> ah, yes. So you're referring to Kentaro Watch Japan, where I walked from the south to the north of Japan and made a documentary about it. Um, I will likely not be doing a sequel uh i have made movies since then i tried to run across iran which i guess was is kind of a sequel it, the movie's called i ran i ran and i <laughs> um made it i actually went to iran after the amazing race uh, about six months after we had been announced uh the winners and went with a good friend of mine who i grew up with named Bobak, whose parents are iranian american and went to run the length of Iran to kind of highlight the hospitality and 
kindness of the Iranian people, especially towards Americans. When you go to Iran as an American, they're really incredibly friendly, even though there's some uh, there's political tension between our countries. And Iran, Iran was going to be a way to highlight that kindness and hospitality. Um, went to Iran, started running 100 miles, and uh, they uh, unfortunately, uh, the, even though the Iranian government was paying for the trip while I was there, uh, there were some complications with the run as to the, le the legitimacy of me being there and uh, had to leave. So that's too bad. I ran part of the but, Iran? <laughs> I ran part of the Iran. I know. So we have, we have what we think is the, the first act of a, of a fun documentary. And one day, maybe when my daughter and maybe if I have more kids are all out to school, my buddy Bob Ack and I will head back to Iran and finish the run and subsequently the documentary. Or just use the so relay said, race and everyone gets deported every hundred miles or so. There you go. That's one way for sure. I like that, <laughs> that thinking. Uh, there's also, a, we made a movie called Big in Bollywood, which is on Netflix. It's about a friend of mine who became a famous Bollywood movie star overnight and what that adventure was like for him. And you guys can watch that to this day. I tried is there, to do a movie is called there Snapple? Is there Snapple? Yeah, is there Snapple in this Bollywood film? Because I'm just used to seeing Snapple in every Bollywood themed uh, setup now. Oh, uh, this might be one of the only movies that takes place in Bollywood without Snapple. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Wow, not since Slumdog <laughs> Millionaire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Totally. Um, we I did one called Wrestling Mongolia where I tried to wrestle a hundred Mongolians. Um, that's on <laughs> that's on Amazon Prime. I don't necessarily recommend it. It was a fun movie uh, and it's silly, but not was it's it not maybe my what's it? Was it inspired by the Herculean effort task where you and BJ wrestled a bunch of Greek uh, Greek dudes in a ring? Yes, definitely. Or did they train you? Did they train you for it? Yeah, that was kind of definitely a precursor to wrestling 100 Mongolians. I, I realized, wow, wrestling people in foreign countries is a, is a great way to, to interact with the culture. You're literally embracing them and then knocking them to the floor. Big in Bollywood is on Netflix UK, by the way. I've just checked. Oh, great. Would you rather wrestle a hundred Mongolian-sized Greek guys or one Greek-sized Mongolian? I'm going to go for a hundred. Uh, just for sheer quantity. I'm all about just doing things a bunch of times. Or 78. Ooh, uh, seven or eight. I'll do seven or eight. <laughs> you may get more than you bargained for with that number. Um, <laughs> who from... <laughs> who else from the who else from your season or I guess any other season do you uh do you still keep in contact with? Oof. Uh, and why is it Barry? only John and Scott? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John and Scott, they're they're really nice guys. They actually sent me a t shirt after the show. Um the Fran and Barry will occasionally reach out. They were the elder couple on our uh on our season who did very well. Uh, they were so nice on the show. We were very incentivized to keep them on, A, because we liked them, and B, they literally told us that if it was came down to a final sprint to the finish line between them and us, they would let us go in front of them, which was just like, oh, wow, that's one way to keep us wanting you on the show. Um, no yields for you. <laughs> no no yields, yield exactly. season. <laughs> It'll be a yield yeah, drought. <laughs> yield drought. It'll be like yield apocalypse. Um, so we, so Fran and Barry, we keep in touch. Uh, Eric and Jeremy, I feel like we're still friends, even though we never talk to each other. Uh, there's kind of this, this thing that happens where you see, or we saw contestants for a while afterwards and would, would communicate. Um, and even though we haven't seen each other in so many years, it still feels like if we picked up and somebody called and said, Hey, I'm in town, let's meet up for lunch be like almost no time passed because the experience was just so intense that and when you're having this when you share that common intense experience uh it's like going to college with somebody you know, that was 10 15 years ago i haven't seen you in a long time but yeah let's let's meet up and see what's going on uh i can't say that we're close friends with a lot of the other teams though still 
do you guys still keep up with the show in general or a bit or a bit backed off from it in the past few years? Um, I think BJ keeps in touch with it more than I do. Like I said, if, if I start watching it, it makes me anxious and just ends up not being super pleasurable. Um, I kind of, I feel like I just need more people in my life who are into the show uh, if I'm going to get excited about it. But if I go kind of actively watching it on my own. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing that's happening, which is really exciting. So my wife has a brother whose name is uh, John Hennigan. John Hennigan went by Johnny Nitro or John Morrison in the WWE for many years. He's on and Survivor. He's on Survivor. Yes. So he will be, uh, He'll be on Survivor this, I think, September or October is when it airs. And so my latest watch of reality TV was kind of watching some Survivor and catching up on the rules and etiquette in that game show. And I got to say, look, even watching Survivor took me back to the Amazing Race and kind of you know, got my heart racing again and, and the adrenaline pumping. And yeah, I'm, uh, I'm nervous to, to go through that again watching watching John. It makes you taste the crickets in your mouth as you're watching it. Oh, baby, I'm back. I'm in cricket, cricket <laughs> land. There's a very real chance that John could be eating much, much worse if a gross food eating challenge comes up. <laughs> exactly. So take us through that final leg and how much of a payoff it was to memorize the world of flags uh, uh, in that final challenge. Yeah, well, we had so much time in the final interview just sitting in our room one game we found online was this flag memorization quiz uh, where it'd show you a bunch of flags and ask you to pick, pick out like you know, Papua New Guinea or uh, Tibet, and you just be, or not Tibet, uh, uh, Bhutan and um, you know, Sierra Leone. And you'd be picking these flags that uh, we weren't familiar with at the time. And I feel like we got most of the country's flags kind of under our belt. Uh, so we went into the show with some flag knowledge because we had seen a previous season that where they had uh, had a flag exercise, a flag-based exercise. So final leg of the race, and oof, kind of we were flying from Alaska to Denver, and I had seen a previous season. I'm, I'm not sure if I can remember which season it was. Uh, one of the contestants had called a taxi special as he was flying to the final city, and it was waiting for him, and it had been a clutch moment where because he had called ahead and got this taxi waiting for him, they were able to kind of speed past everybody and get to the finish line first and while everybody else was waiting for taxis. So when we left Alaska, I had called the Denver airport and said, hey, I'd like a taxi waiting for me or called a Denver taxi um, service. And they said, you know what? There's always taxis there 24-7. Uh, don't worry about it. There'll be a taxi there. I was like, well, I just want to make sure 100% there's a taxi. It's really important that I have a taxi there. The guy's like, look, I live here. I'm working the taxi business. Don't worry. There's going to be ta a line of taxis waiting for you no matter what time you land. Sure enough, we land in Denver and there are no taxis. I'm just kicking <laughs> myself. I'm thinking, God, I like I tried to call this taxi in and I was going to be the big heroic moment that I'd learned the strategy from a previous season and um, there was no taxi. So we ended up taking a shuttle to a hotel, which was right next to the airport and finding a taxi there, taxiing to the first uh, the second to last challenge, which was finding a clue in this big park. And by the time we got there, the frat boys had Eric and Jeremy had already found a clue and were on their way out. And at that moment, I thought, well, we just lost the race. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, uh, second place is great. No big, no problem. I I'm happy. I'm thrilled we get to finish this awesome experience and kind of set myself up uh, for second place because Ray and Yolanda were not. In, in sight. So we found the second clue. We raced to Red Rocks and we know this is the finish line because this is where we started the race 28 days earlier. And we pull up to Red Rocks and there's this giant field of snow. 28 days earlier, there was no snow. So it's very surreal to come back and have this place that we'd left from a month before now covered in a winter wonderland snow. And in this field are flapping uh, hundreds of flags. These flags are from all sorts of different countries, and the task was to line the flags up in the order of the countries you had visited along the race, the nine different countries. So we saw Eric and Jeremy running, grabbing flags, and they had a seven-minute head start. Seven minutes is eons, eons. 
nine flags, no big deal. So we couldn't see their flags, the order, because they were behind this big curtain. So BJ is going to do the task. We'd always switched off tasks. Who was going to do it? It was his turn. So he runs out, picks the first flag of the first country, second flag, third flag. Two of the most challenging flags are Thailand and Oman. Um, can you imagine Thailand's flag or, or Oman's flag in your mind? Or uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Another thing is, as you got the clue to go to each country during the show, there would be a little flag of the country you were about to visit on the clue. Um, which is kind of funny. We would talk about it. We'd go, oh, look, there's a little like kanji dagger on the Omanian flag. Like, look at that. We'd talk to people about their flags in the countries. So we were pretty familiar with all the flags. Um, and we start putting it, putting them in the order. And we actually skipped over Russia, uh, which is a red, white, and blue striped flag. And just weren't thinking of it because while there was a pit stop in Russia, it was uh, there was no layover. It was just, you hit the mat with Phil and then he sends you, continues the race. And so we get to the end and there's still an extra slot where we uh, where we needed to have a flag. And we realized, oh, Russia was part of this. We need to put a Russian flag in. So BJ runs out, grabs the Russian flag. Meanwhile, the frat boys are still there. I'm like, this is crazy that the frat boys are still doing this. They must have really messed something up. BJ uh, is, it is incredible. Denver is a mile high city. He's running back and forth in the snow for many many minutes and you know i was exhausted just running just screaming at him it was he was a herculean effort by some herculean dude uh to get the flags and and to bring them back so quickly put them all in order and i remember that the woman says you are correct and we just start running to the finish line as fast as we can and he was so out of breath i grabbed behind him and i started pushing him and i remember as we got past the frat boys looking over and they kind of shake their heads Oh my gosh, they're giving up. They see that we're running. I just still am in disbelief. And as soon as we kind of get within sprinting or about 30 feet ahead of them and past them, that's when I think, oh, we might actually win this. That was the moment. Run up some steps, run around a corner, and there you see all the teams lined up, that very iconic moment of all the teams clapping and cheering, waiting for you. And there's Phil standing on the mat. Such a surreal experience to actually live that run up to the mat all the, the, the screaming and yelling and you get up to the mat and it's just the ultimate sigh oh, of relief now there's actually something kind of funny that it was in the back of our minds here where the and i hope they don't come after us for this but there was a there was a the clue said take a taxi from the airport to this park where we were supposed to pick up the first clue that then took us to um, Red Rocks, and we had taken a shuttle to the taxi. Ooh. And in the back of our minds, we're thinking, is that a penalty? Could they pull that out? And of course, we were over, you know, we had a lot to lose. So that's why we were thinking about it. But as we crossed the finish line, and he said, you know, you guys are the winners of the amazing race. We're just like, oh my gosh. Okay. Well, so far, no one's called a penalty for us taking a shuttle to a, to a taxi because technically, you're supposed to follow the rules to kind of to a T. Um, and yeah, this is the first time I've kind of confessed that I think we're far enough away from the show. Or... These are your confessions. Bill's yeah, going to fly can... over there right now and revoke the title and place it on the frat boys' heads. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, you guys, you can do, I mean, because they, they came in seven minutes after us. So that technically, if we had a 15 minute penalty, they would have won. Edit this uh, out, can Michael. Can get it, frat boys? <laughs> Spends all the money, so <laughs> you have fun getting it back. Wow! So yeah, that would be crazy if if uh, Phil says you guys are the winners. However, and that however yeah. makes all the difference. We were halfway expecting that uh, that however. I mean, and we we were looking at each other with BJ and I were just looking at each other with these like really wide freak eyes, like uh. Is this real? Are they gonna? Is there gonna be this moment where everything stops and says, "Oh, wait, we have some new information," because that wouldn't be too unlike the show. Uh, but they didn't. And basically, after they did our closing interview, um, they, they take you to a room. It's really intense. You go, we won. They take it. They say, oh, "Okay, come to this room." You go in this room, and all of a sudden, there's this like you're in this. You're sitting at a table with a bunch of lawyers. Like, where did you guys come from? They're all wearing their suits. And they explain to you 
look, you now have intellectual property inside of your head of who won, who, who won this season. Um, you've signed like a 250 page document stating you won't tell anybody, but we're here to tell you really don't tell a person. And they, they tell you, you've got everything to lose, especially you guys, you've got the prize to lose. We could sue you up to $10 million and liquidate your assets. If you tell anybody we've, seized hard drives from people's homes before that we suspected had been yes you know, propagating winners of shows the show is based part of the success of the show is people not knowing who wins and uh just don't tell anybody everyone will eventually find out what happens um so don't even tell don't tell your family don't tell your significant others just don't tell and we we took that to heart we did not tell a soul uh, I didn't tell my the woman I was dating at the time. I didn't tell my family. Um, and even right up until the end, the flags, my family still thought that I hadn't won. They just, it would, yeah. So we, I was impressed. I was impressed because when you're in your 20s and you get home and it's a really crazy thing happens where people ask you, oh, so tell me who won. They're like, oh, I can't. And they go like, oh, come on, just tell me. And then you tell them a second time, sorry, I can't. And then they ask you a third time. And that's the moment of truth third time you say look I that's really when you wrestle up. Not... Uh, yeah yeah, yeah you're <laughs> totally body slam and then they get the point it's funny because people would ask three times and for the most part three times was about when people got it and they would stop asking oh i get it you're not going to tell me <laughs> three and three Some no's people. actually means no <laughs> three no's yes two who knows <laughs> two no's is a maybe <laughs> And and BJ would have even more to lose because if he told somebody, then he'd be stuck in BJ Novak's uh, basement for the next uh, ten oh, years, I, I presume. Yes, which he would not like. Just hear him and Mindy Kaling just writing down jokes for the office until God knows oh, when. Exactly. Exactly. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, do you guys know about the BJ show? We, I haven't seen it personally. I just know about the BJ BJ uh, connection there. Yeah, they did a show together at Harvard called the BJ Show. BJ Novak and BJ Averill. It was incredible. It was a variety show. They had Bob Saget on one year. They did a, a Blue Man parody one year. It was a really funny sold out show that they did a couple of years. And it was the BJ Show. Was there any other fun uh, behind the scenes stuff that we didn't get to see from your guys this season? Uh, there was a time in Brazil in Sao Paulo where we were at, uh, one of the challenges very early in the morning, it was six or seven in the morning and the bars were getting out. And this one woman, I think her name was Priscilla. She, she had a really fun evening the night before and she just like fell in love with BJ. And we were, while we were waiting for about an hour for the challenge to, to get kicking, BJ and her kind of developed this romance and the whole thing was filmed and we were convinced they were going to show it on the episode. But uh, they were like hugging and even like did a little bit of smooching and were really like liked each other a lot. And it was like kind of an adorable little budding romance that these two had that just was so unexpected. And I looked down at one of our sound men and he pulls out of his pocket a condom. I'm like, oh my gosh, what are you doing with a condom? Like that is he's joining in. Kind of, <laughs> and he, he just looked at me and he's like, uh, uh it's don't worry about it i was like what no that's really strange that you have that like what's going on and he told me later that it was because when it gets like if it, if it rains you need to have condoms to cover up the sound packs the, the microphone packs and so it was just like this strange moment of like the sound man with a condom and bj kind of and this woman like very in enraptured with each other and uh like wow what is happening at six here in the morning of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And apparently that was also the night Mike Tyson was there and had punched somebody at the bar that we were standing next to uh, that night. He, somebody was trying to take a picture of him and he punched the guy and broke his camera. And it was this big thing that had happened. And that was kind of wild. Um, I would say the one thing you don't really see the relationship between your cameraman and sound man on the show, but we had some really, really wonderful crew on a show who you'd spend hours with in the cars, getting to know them, talking about their experience. And these are people who would cover wartime and they would, they would go hiking in the jungle to do documentaries of, uh, of people that would live deep in the jungle. And one, I remember one cameraman telling me that he was doing a multi-week documentary of these people that lived in the jungle. And 
At one point, he was eating monkey, and he remembers nibbling the meat off around the fingers and just trying to chew the meat from these little monkey hands, which looked like human hands, and kind of teething it. And it was like, wow, you guys are really hardcore. And we'd be in our 20s running as fast as we could through a marketplace. And these guys would be carrying 40, 45-pound gear backpacks, able to keep up. I mean, they're, they're true superheroes. Uh, and the producers were friendly. I mean, it's just a, it's just such a positive experience behind the scene. And um, the pit stops were t- most, for the most part, 12 hours. But occasionally, we'd have a 36-hour pit stop. The 36 hours were great. There was one in Japan where we got to hang out at Fujiku Highlands Amusement Park and um, just eat great food and walk around and kind of relax and get to spend a little more, a little less stressful time with some of the other teams, uh, which, which was very pleasurable. We had a 36 hour in Greece and I just remember eating the most delicious Greek food that I've had uh, in memory, cheeses and breads and olives. Wow. Tastes better than monkeys. It tastes a lot better than monkeys. People ask a lot, like, do you get time to experience the places you go? Uh, not in the same way with normal travel. Normal travel, you, you go to a place and you stand there and you take some pictures and and you walk around and maybe you get a guide or maybe you just read your guidebook. And it's a different pace of traveling. The Amazing Race, though, because, because you're in this like heightened state of awareness, you actually remember almost every single thing for a long time. I mean, I'm pretty forgetful now. I blame the dad brain for that. And, waking up in the middle of the night all the time but um the uh the, kind of the action-packed intense nature of it you you do feel like it's it's different kind of travel but you get a lot packed into 28 days i mean you get it feels like the equivalent of th- three or four months of traveling packed in one and when you get home you almost feel like you just saw a day in a life of the planet because everything's so fresh on your mind, if you can kind of teleport back to these places in, in the spaceship of your imagination and just kind of experience them retroactively all simultaneously. And the planet feels very close afterwards. Nothing feels very far away. We're like, oh, you guys are right there. I can just hop on a plane and be anywhere. Um, it's like almost like Bill and Ted. Totally. Totally. <laughs> Yes, except you don't have Abe Lincoln to teleport uh, with you to each place, I guess. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Or so crates. <laughs> so crates. I am amazed by that tangent, by the way. We managed to go from BJ making out with somebody to condoms to Mike Tyson to monkeys to... I, I don't even know what the hell else was in that tangent. That was amazing. <laughs> well, and... Yeah, and Bill and Ted's. Yes, of course. We've done Bill it. and Ted to cap it off. There? What else is there? I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, um, gosh, if you guys are ever in San Francisco, please let me know. I'd love to love to meet up. I uh, have a restaurant out here, and I'd be happy to host you and swap more stories. When I go there, I, I'm only going to order seven or eight sprites. I need to make that very clear, uh, Tyler. Only seven, seven or eight. eight. Just get the crate you ready for him. <laughs> Just get the crate. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. You drink that. it all, the meal is free. <laughs> exactly. Seven or eight sprites. I love how that is just one of my my favorite stories of the whole thing. There's so many amazing things that happen. The seven or eight sprites just really sticks out. I feel bad. It rained every day for them in Lisbon. You don't really uh, hear that uh, no, too often guys. there. More in the north than Porto. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, do you guys watch Survivor? Yes. Oh, I'm covering all the international uh, versions for uh, various websites. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah. Let's root John on together. It should be fun. He's, uh, he's a really incredible guy. He's something very special. That John. Are you a David or a Goliath, Tyler? Oh, wow. Me? Like, what team would I be on? Jeez. I'm definitely not a Goliath, which means that I'd probably be a David. Let's be honest, it's not the first time that Logan's asked someone what team they're on. (laughs) I'm on a Goliath. Goliath? So it's like a really long-haired Goliath. (laughs) David and Goliath adopt a kid from like Arizona who ends up like just being a, a long haired 
toad smoking, uh, Cosmo dancing hippie spends most of his time at Burning Man, even when it's not happening. And uh, that's me. Well, that is quite the maybe if they do a three tribe format like they usually do in recent seasons, maybe they can they can build a third tribe just just for you, Tyler. <laughs> oh, thanks. I hope so. Well, you guys have been absolutely lovely. I I uh, I uh, I'm supposed to head over to the East Bay and get there by five or sixteen. Um. So I should probably, unfortunately, boogie, but I do, uh, I, I had a absolute lovely time talking with you. If you guys, have, if you guys want to talk to BJ, I can, uh, if he's unresponsive, I can definitely help you guys get in touch with him. He's, he's fun to chat with for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Jinx, you owe me a Sprite, Michael. No, you were too late. Oh! Suck it, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I wish you guys best of luck with the uh, podcast and and everything else. I hope I one day get to watch you two racing around the world in whatever form. And uh, like I said, uh, feel free to reach out next time you're in San Francisco. Yeah, for sure. That'd be sweet. Thank you for your time. And thank you, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, chatting with you on Saturday afternoon. Where, what else would we be doing? <laughs> uh, Other than uh, driving through riding, congested... Riding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'd be uh, writing to Tao on your knuckles. <laughs> every, every time you tell a lie, it digs deeper into the knuckles. It's like uh, <laughs> Harry Potter with the I will not tell lies burning into our wrist. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We are your new society. What can I say? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, uh, hopefully we get a chance to chat uh, chat again uh, one day. Maybe I'll be on season 58 running across Iran. We'll do another recap. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll chat once yeah. you've uh, once you've ran Iran. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right, gents. Uh, be well. Be excellent to each other. And uh, don't eat too many crickets. We can't promise. Yeah, I'm a vegetarian, <laughs> so it'll be fine. Oh, you're good. You're good. Yeah, lapsed vegetarian, Logan. We don't need to start that conversation again. Yeah, that's that's true. You're, <laughs> I, you know, I was a, I was a vegetarian when I when I did the race too, but uh, you'll what no, the things we'll do for a few ducats. <laughs> we'll sacrifice our morals for a million dollars. <laughs> yes, we will. A million dollars used to be a lot more. <laughs> that's yeah. Now I don't even know what a million dollars is because I just we just beat it day. into a furnace to keep warm at night. Yeah, exactly. Here in Silicon Valley, a million dollars is uh, you know that's like a cappuccino and a stone. All right, guys. See you later. It's been, it's been a pleasure. All right, talk to you later. Bye. Thanks again. <laughs> Take care. So, thank you for listening to this Amazing Race podcast. You can join us next week for another interview. If you've got any questions, feel free to contact us on our Facebook page, Reality TV Warriors, on our Twitter account, RTV Warriors, or on Twitter pages, MJ Homestone for me, and Logs for Cracky for Logan. See you next week. Peace out, and just chill till the next interview.